Two lifelong friends. <laughs> Drop a hoss on them like they did the Dark Age. Between them, more than 50 years of tabletop Battletech experience. Why are you dressed up like Indianapolis Jones? They're looking for some of the biggest Wobby Whoppers and Periphery Jump Ship Crew superstitions of lore, rules misfires, and shocking truths as they search for the facts in the fiction of Battletech. What's up, Battletech fans? Here we are with yet another edition of Finding the Facts in the Fiction. But these myths come from all the way up north in the Rust Belt, straight from Gen Con, directly into your living room. And Jeff, I've brought you three big whoppers from the four biggest days of gaming. How the hell you doing? I'm doing great. Looking forward to this. I love these segments. I'm not going to waste too much of your time, not going to waste too much of everybody else's time. I'm going to jump right in to one of your absolute favorites. I know this one's right up your alley because we're talking ma, 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 mask. I love mask. Okay, so here goes the myth. Back in the day, when you failed on mask, we know how it works now, and I know you know how it works now. But back in the day, the myth goes that failure on a mask roll, so you roll snake eyes, you don't make another roll after consecutive use, what have you, it causes a critical hit to simultaneously occur to both hips. Is it true? Did it ever happen that way? I don't think so, because I've used masks for a while. I mean, simultaneous losing of both hips, I don't recall that happening. Unfortunately, your brain has failed you because you are 100% <laughs> wrong on that one. No. There are a lot of different intricacies when it comes to the mask system, and it hasn't just always had one rule set. This rule has in fact gone over at least three different rule books since its inception in the Battletech Compendium in 1990. So what we're going to do is we're going to investigate this old school style by taking the hands and turning them back on the clock all the way to the very first Battletech Compendium. So here we are on page 120 of the original Battletech Compendium under Myomer Accelerator Signal Circuitry. Now, this is just a description of the system and what it does, but up here in this paragraph is where we get to the punishments. So, we see here that any battle mech with mask can activate the system before the movement phase of any turn. The player declares that he is using the mask system and rolls 2d6. On a 3 or better, the battle mech can run that turn at a speed equal to double its standard walking speed. If the result is 2, the leg actuators freeze up, immobilizing the battle mech for the rest of the game. Now Jeff, let me ask you this. Is there any other set of critical hit effects that could occur that would immobilize your battle mech for the rest of the game? Any set of circumstances whatsoever? Well, no, I suppose I suppose not. Hey, he's wrong again, kids, because we gotta bust out the Battletech Compendium Rules of Warfare, Warfare, Warfare. And here's the thing, not only are you wrong on that point, but you are going to get the back end of that stick in this book here. Because we're gonna turn to the same section, the construction area, and we are going to go here to it looks like page 119. And as stated, here we are on page 119 of the Battletech Compendium Rules of Warfare Edition under Myomer Accelerator Signal Circuitry. This is pretty much the same description as it was before, but we get down here to the punishments again. On a result of free or higher, the battle mech can run that turn at a speed equal to double its standard walking movement points. On a result of two, the leg actuators freeze up for the rest of the game, the effects of which are identical to the mech taking a critical hit to both hip actuators. But the question there is, did two hip critical hits immobilize you for the rest of the game? That's page 41 of the Rules of Warfare edition, so we'll flip to that. So just a few pages later, on page 44, we have the hip critical hit section. A hip critical hit freezes the affected leg in a straight position. After a hip critical hit, the battle mech's walking movement point is cut in half, rounding up. That we knew, ignoring any movement modifiers from previous critical hits on that leg. A plus two modifier is required, this and that, we already know. Down here is where the relevant part is. A critical hit to the second hip reduces the battle mech's movement points to zero and adds another plus two modifier to its piloting skill roll target number. 
And if we get out Total Warfare, this is the most recent printing I have. I want to say this is like the corrected seventh printing or something like that. Am I right about that? No, I don't know. I was right. Corrected seventh printing. Okay, cool. <laughs> so let's go to combat one more time for them critical hit effects, right? So we have the hip section here on page 127 of Total Warfare. We just have to get down to the punishment section. A critical hit to the second hip reduces the mech's movement points to zero. So, it's exactly the same there as it was then. I can almost guarantee you going as far back as battle droids, that's what it's also going to say. But, in the interest of fairness, let's investigate. And here we have, dun dun dun, dun the battle droids rulebook. And we are going to flip to page 18. So here we are, page 18 of the battle droids rulebook. And we have leg critical hit hip. So we're going to get to the punishments. A second critical hit to the same hip has no further effect, but a critical hit to the other leg immobilizes the droid and adds another plus two modifier to its piloting skill roll. So even though it doesn't say the walking movement or whatever is reduced to zero, the further wording there is exactly the same as what the later wordings would end up becoming. So I think we can safely surmise at this point that that rule has been that way since battle droids. Two hit critical hits put you out of movement point level of zero. Right. And we just saw, as in the Battletech Compendium Rules of Warfare, a mask failure on whatever role you make will cause the same effect as two critical hits to the hip. Uh -huh. Now, does that mean that, and here's where your opinion comes in, that the mech actually did take two critical hits to the hip, or was it same as, and therefore not same as? <laughs> Which well, is it? Uh, sure, I mean, you would mark off your, your hips, I mean, as critical hits, I mean. So, you would venture as far as to say that this one is confirmed, Okay. and two critical hits to the hip did sure. in fact used to occur upon mass failure. So my next one comes from a special place at Gen Con, Jeff. This comes from the tables of Masters and Minions, and it involves line of sight. Now, I know you know how line of sight works today insofar as declaring a weapon attack. The target will be the one to determine where the line of sight line traces through if it happens to traverse directly on the line in between two hexes. Correct? As far as I'm aware. That is correct. Howsomever, the myth goes like this. Was there ever a time in which that determination was made by the side that won the initiative? As in, the team who won initiative is the one who will determine which hex does or does not fall within line of sight when it passes directly down the line in between two hexes. I'm not sure. I have no idea. Let's investigate. So to answer this question, we are going to go to the original Battletech manual, page 17, for line of sight. Now, the paragraph that's going to be relevant here is, if the straight edge passes directly between two hexes, the defender chooses through which hex the line of sight passes. So what that means is, the Battletech manual was pretty much the first serious attempt at making a core rulebook. Mm -hmm. So I guarantee you, if it's that way in the Battletech manual, it's going to be that way in Battle Droids. It's going to be that way in Battletech Second Edition. So let's investigate. Is it still that way today in Total Warfare? So here we are under Line of Sight, page 99 of Total Warfare. And we just need to look at the second paragraph here. If the LOS passes exactly between two hexes, the player controlling the targeted unit decides which of the two hexes lie along the LOS. So we can safely say this one's busted. At no time did the initiative winning side determine where the LOS was falling if the line went directly in between two hexes. Okay, yeah. Never happened. All right.
So I picked up more than just a few goodies while I was at Gen Con, and one of the things I came home with was a brand spanking new Savage Wolf, Savage Wolf, baby. And that particular miniature leads me into my final myth here, and that comes to me directly from a player who sat across from me playing none other than a Savage Wolf. He was firing a lot of his guns, and I was calculating the heat myself because it has a double XL engine. And I know these things run hot. And I asked him, what's your heat got to be looking like? And as it turns out, through a little bit of conversation we learned, he didn't know that a double XL engine in fact generates far more heat than a standard fusion engine or a standard extra light engine. So my question to you is this, is it true or is it just fairy tale folklore from the deep periphery? I've never used a double XL engine, so I don't know. See, at the time, on site, I didn't have my rule book with me. I was told by my friend I probably wouldn't have to bring one. But here in the studio, I just so happen to have the Tactical Operations Handbook for Advanced Units and Equipment. And this is where you will find your answer on page 121. And so we have traversed to page 121 here of the Tactical Operations Handbook for Advanced Units and Equipment, XXL Fusion Engine. XXL fusion engines run hotter than their other fusion equivalents. Standing still, or expending no thrust, generates two points of heat per turn. Walking or safe thrust movement generates four heat points, and running max thrust movement generates six heat points. Heat generated per hex jumped is doubled for XXL engine users, with a minimum of six points per jump. The heat modifiers for improved jump jet use and jumping with an XXL engine cancel each other out. Combat vehicles using XXL engines do not have to track movement heat as per the standard combat vehicle rules. So, knowing that the extra extra light engine runs significantly hotter than its standard and extra light engine counterparts, is the Savage Wolf still as savage as they make it out to be? Not as, but it's pretty still good. I, I like it. You see, it still has two ERP PCs. You can't take that away from it. And you know, with those clan ERP PCs, it really just takes one. From downrange, knock somebody's block off, and all this slack, John, don't mean nothing. But that extra added heat for a Savage Wolf Prime, anyway, is still going to be kind of a problem. I mean, you can walk right and you can fire those two guns you can get away with it a couple of turns it's kind of like you know a, a pocket awesome in that way you fire fire you let off you fire fire you let off so i mean it's not terrible it does remove a little bit of the teeth from that thing to know that there's this just insane amount of extra added heat on there that's going to really slow down the amount of stuff that i'm willing to fire and you know what it is with clan mechs everybody wants to get in there and just pull the trigger alpha strike baby the more you can fire the better you're doing so with these units going up against other clan units having to work their firing solutions around every so often could potentially hamper them there. And with extra extra light engines, it's not just about getting the side torso taken off, man. I mean, with clans, you get four slots that have to be allocated to each side torso as opposed to the standard two for a regular extra light engine, but the inner sphere gets it really bad. It's like six six slots and so this isn't about the side torso getting taken off like i said it's about somebody using something dumb on you like tandem charge warheads they get a couple of pips internal structure on your right or left torso and they roll a single critical hit well now they've got four or six extra engine slots in there to hit and you're already running hot with these things anyway so you take a savage wolf you get an additional five points of heat on you when you're already having to manage it as it is. Boy, how do you go from being able to, you know, two, two lay off to just being able to fire one and then maybe some missiles and that's all you got. You go from Savage Wolf to Neutered Wolf real quick. <laughs> so, yeah. knowing that, is that something that you would be willing to construct a mech with in the future or even choose a unit that had extra, extra light? I might shy away from it, but I... I could if I needed to. I, I, I could go either way. Yeah, that's just something I cannot abide. <laughs> the extra, extra light for inner sphere. Uh, the normal XL engines just bother me already. So, all right, Battletech fans, that concludes episode number eight of Finding the Facts in the Fiction, coming all the way from Gen Con, baby. And if you like what you've seen so far, do us a big favor and hit that subscribe bell down there. Turn on all notifications so you can find out exactly where Battlebound's gonna turn up next. And don't forget, folks, Battlebound has a Patreon at patreon.com slash battlebound. Sign up today to enjoy those benefits tomorrow. For myself and my broadcast partner, Jeff Snyder, we're sure looking forward to seeing you next time right here, out on the Space Lane.
Hmm, your ideas are intriguing to me, and I wish to subscribe to your newsletter. Crowdfunding is when lots of people give you small amounts of money to help your passion project come to life. 